Thank you. So you're a Swift developer, and one day your boss calls and tells you, hey, could we reuse the core technology that we have in our mobile application and deploy it to the web? You think about it for a while and say, hmm, why not? Um, being a developer today involves more than just coding for a single platform. In many cases, your skills need to extend across multiple operating systems and languages. And building a mobile application often implies uh, processing data on both the device and the server, and sometimes with the same algorithms. Swift has matured over the last couple of years into a viable solution to deploy the same code on Apple platforms and on Linux. Um, while tooling on Linux is still very bare bones, code written in Swift runs great, and it can be used in a production context, as Pim just did a uh, show in his presentation. If you need to get convinced, uh, look at the server frameworks written in Swift and look at the level of quality they have reached. So yes, I think that you can deploy and maintain portable Swift code. It just requires more preparation and care than your typical mobile project. So let's have a look at how you can do it. So to share your code, you'll need to make it a cross-platform Swift library. The first, thing, the first thing you'll need to do is to package it. Uh, CocoaPods and Cartage are the popular package manager choices for applications on Apple platforms, uh, but they can only target Xcode projects, and they are not available on Linux. So the first tool you want to learn is SPM, the Swift Package Manager. It's built right into the Swift toolchain. It can pull your dependencies, uh, run your tests, build your products, and generate Xcode projects for you. It also offers some very nice advanced features, like the ability to put a dependency into edit mode, which means that it pulls the local uh, clone of the dependencies, and you can work on the code without having to commit, tag, and push uh, before you build a project. So it saves a lot of time, and it's very handy when you are working on your own uh, portable library. On the downside, SPM doesn't support iOS and tvOS. Um, well, you've been beaten by this, Pim. Um, it's a very much requested feature. It's probably just a matter of time before support is available. I know that many people are advocating for it. In the meantime, the workaround is to modify the generated Xcode project, which is initially for macOS. And one example technique uh, involves using a Ruby tool which modifies the Xcode project that the SPM generates. And it turns it into a framework project that you can include in your application. So more details about this can be found in the blog post I link in the slide. Uh, to write portable code, uh, you need uh, a framework that insulates you as much as possible from the underlying platform. Uh, the Swift Standard Library provides a lot of types and algorithms. But aside from the new random function that you find in Swift 4.2, which runs the same way on Apple and Linux, uh, it does little to abstract access to the running platform. So Apple's foundation framework has been rebuilt in Swift uh, for Linux and provides the same API you find on Apple platforms. But while this is true for most of foundation, you should be aware that uh, some APIs are not completely working on Linux yet. So for example, the NS Predicate API uh, is incomplete. The XML parsing API is mostly there, but not completely. And while basic NS array and NS set support is here, uh, NSR descriptor is not available. So you'll want to look at the status page, uh, which is linked here, uh, to check whether the APIs you need are available or not. If your code needs to do networking, I recommend that you look into Swift NIO. Uh, it's a new high-performance, fully asynchronous framework created by Apple and designed to run on Linux and on Mac OS. But then, to use on iOS and tvOS, you can add the NIO transport services package, uh, which is also by Apple. And this package uh, relies on the new network framework, which is available starting with iOS 12. So you, you won't have backwards compatibility. Now, one crucial aspect of running code on multiple platforms is good testing. Uh, you want to automate testing of your code as much as possible and run these tests on all the platforms you target. Uh, fortunately, the exit test framework, uh, you know, in Xcode is also available on Linux. Uh, so you can look at these links for more information. And I can give you three good reasons uh, why you want to be serious with testing. The first is that you need to make sure that your own portable code runs and produces the same results on all the target platforms. 
Uh, second, as I mentioned, uh, foundation is not 100% equal on Linux and on Apple platforms, so you need to verify that it works too. And third, uh, when you get a crash on Linux, uh, it can be very hard to track and debug, especially if it happens uh, in a server. The reason for this is that when the process crashes on Linux, um, it writes a core dump file to the disk. Uh, a core dump file is basically a binary version of the crash log you know in Xcode. But you need to go through the command line debugger to load and examine the, the stack trace uh, from the core dump file. And it can be a pain, especially since uh, on many uh, Docker containers, the Linux instance is not configured to write crash logs uh, when a crash occurs. So you will need this command line uh, in your setup. Now, let's talk a bit about dependencies. Um, SPM handles dependencies quite well, but there are a few details you want to pay attention to. When including your library in your application with SPM, you can perfectly pull it from a branch or a specific commit, because you may be working on some special features. But if your library itself has branch or commit-specific dependencies, uh, you're in trouble. Uh, these transitive dependencies, uh, which are the dependencies of dependencies, have to come from their own master branch. This is a limitation of SPM. Also note that SPM relies on semantic version tagging. So make sure that you have a good hygiene on this front. Uh, if you see SPM taking a long time to update, it's usually a good sign that you messed up uh, semantic version tagging in your commits. Or maybe one of the dependencies has issues with that. In any case, uh, dependencies that fully support running on all platforms, uh, supported by Swift, are the exception. Um, speaking of which, one key component of many products is a built-in database. I've been using Realm a lot on macOS and iOS, but there is no embedded Realm database for Linux. So uh, I looked around and picked a SQLite. Uh, SQLite is a rock-solid and well-tested database that's available everywhere. It will never let you down. Uh, the cool thing is that you can take a database file on one platform and use it on another platform without any change. But using the SQLite C API uh, is low-level and it's tedious. Uh, you're a Swift developer, so you want to write Swift code. Uh, so I have something for you. Uh, GRDB is a beautifully designed front-end uh, for SQLite. And it's a framework which happens to run great on Linux, too. It's maintained with dedication by a French guy named Gwendol, who is not here today, but used to be at the previous editions. So he did a fantastic work on this. Now, when it comes to build, test, and run your code on Linux, uh, it's a good idea to use Docker containers. Uh, the cool thing is that Docker containers free you from dependency of a specific cloud provider. There are Docker base images for multiple versions of Swift. And you can find example Docker files on the net, which can get you started in no time. Now, deploying to the cloud can be a more complicated topic. Uh, my platform of choice can build and run my source code. Uh, but as much as I love them, I can't trust them with my source code, and neither should you. So uh, what I do is this, uh, and what you can do is this. Use a Docker container on your Mac to build your own li uh, Linux executable. Uh, once it's built, pull the executable from the Docker image, um, along with the libraries it uses. And you can push a Docker file to the cloud with your executable binary, the libraries, and the data you need. This way, your source code never gets exposed to third parties. And you can run smaller Linux images because you just need the bare uh, Ubuntu Linux image and not the full Swift compiler thing. So to conclude, I'd say that uh, the maturity of the language and the evolution of the supporting frameworks makes Swift a very good proposition when it comes to scaling code from mobile to the server. It takes a bit more initial care, skills, and, te uh, and effort. But you can automate all the testing and deployment process using shell scripts. This is what I do. And it really pays off in development time and cost. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. OK. Thank you, guys, for your two talks. Um, we have a lot of questions, but uh, maybe we'll, we'll try to focus on like uh, your real uh, life experience. Um, and so 
uh, you said you're using a PIM, you're using a Kitura, right? Yeah. And uh, which framework are you using? I'm using Vabo. Yeah. Okay. And um, why did you do this choice? I had to pick one. <laughs> And, and one of the reasons is that uh, Vapor, I started with Vapor 3, so I didn't go through the pain of migrating from Vapor 2 to Vapor 3, where they basically reacted everything around uh, Swift and I.O. And I find Swift and I.O. absolutely fantastic. So I love the idea, and can I said I went for that. Yeah, can you, can you explain a bit? Uh, because probably some people are not really familiar with uh, Swift and IO, and I think it's a, it's a huge uh, huge move. Yeah, so Swift and IO is a new framework from Apple, uh, which is made to do uh, networking and it, it fully asynchronous networking uh, on on Linux and macOS. And the cool thing is that uh, to do this, they come with a light version of Rx. Uh, which is uh, futures and promises. So it provides its own event loop system with futures and promises. And the Vapor team completely reacted, uh, reacted the server around this. So they had to rewrite everything and they completely broke everyone's code. But uh, the cool thing is that Swift and I was really well designed and I think it's a feature. One of the things you can uh, wonder is why did they do this? Why do they have another new uh, networking framework? They already have the network framework on iOS, which just changes everything on, uh, on iOS and tvOS. I don't really have an answer to that, but I think there is a team at Apple which advocates a lot for Linux compatibility. Uh, you may have some ties with them, I don't know. But um, it's really a big effort for them because they are releasing a lot of open source code now to, to GitHub, which is, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, and do, do you know if <coughs> Sorry. do you know if Kitura also rewrote the uh, the library uh, on top of uh, this uh, Apple framework? Um, they added it. In all honesty, um, Kitura 2.5.1 has the ability to switch to uh, Swift and EIO uh, with just the ease of a command line uh, command. So you can choose between the current stack, which is I think uh, Kitura Net, or you can switch to uh, Swift and EIO and see what the, what the performance is there. And do you know why they kept uh, the old uh, version? Um, for compatibility sake? or Not necessarily for compatibility sake, because on top of it they wrote uh, Kitura itself, and that is fully compatible with, with both. Uh, as an engineer or as a user of their product, when I switch between the two, I don't have to change anything, and it will just work. And if you look at, um, if you look at the branch, they could ditch a lot of their code, which they wrote themselves to uh, to be able to make it work and well using the Swift part now or the Apple part of it now, Swift and AIO, it will just work out of the box for them and they could use uh, or delete a lot of code, which saves maintainability of course. And did you notice any performance uh, improvements? Or? Uh, this thing is so new, it's been released by them uh, a little over a week ago and I haven't got a chance to do uh, extensive testing on it yet. Okay, and about like um, all those frameworks like Kitura, uh, Vapor and all the others, uh, most of them are open source. But uh, did you had the chance to look at the, their code and, and try to dig into that and maybe patch them because it's all quite new and sometimes you will probably uh, meet some, some limitations of the code? Yeah, correctly, we do. And uh, we do actively look at the code and um, not, not as a code review saying, hey, why did you write it like this or that? No, we want to have a good understanding how the project is structured and I think that we have that. Uh, yes, we encounter problems, but instead of opening directly an issue on GitHub, uh, we talk to the guys through Slack. Uh, we are experiencing this and that. Can you confirm? Do you see the same behavior? Well, if that's the case, they'll fix it and patch it for us. Uh, or we send a merge request with, uh, with the fix. So yes, we, we do actively help. And did you do, the, did you do, did you had to do that uh, a lot? Uh, no, not a lot, absolutely not a lot. This only happened twice over the last nine months. Uh, nine, not nine months, 15 months. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, we had it twice, two things that were not working for us. And you, Flo, did you play with the fr framework? Is uh, it accessible? Yeah, it's, actually, it's all open source and you don't really have a choice because when v Vapor 3 was released, uh, it's been like final, it's been final for just a few weeks. So it was very well, uh, not very well documented. So you had to look at the code and had to dig, you know, you have to dig in, in at the code to find out how to do this or this or that. Uh, the cool thing is that uh, they don't have a Slack, they have a Discord uh, chat room. And the cool thing is that the Swift and IO team is on Discord too, on the same rooms. So you can really talk about them, talk to them and, and about the issues you find. Uh, they broke my build a couple times, um, but they are very reactive and they usually fix things within a day. Yeah, that's one question I had for Kitura team. You are saying they are really accessible, yeah. but 
you are uh, you are a, a huge bank and they are like kind of really uh, happy that you are using Kitura, but will they be for small companies or independents like us? Yeah, I can only speak from my own uh, experience, but uh, what I've noticed, the answer to that is yes, absolutely. These guys are so accessible. They're like a small startup. That's the feeling that I have. Small startup within a large enterprise. In inside IBM? Inside IBM, yeah. indeed. And uh, I think they benefit from anyone trying to use their, their stuff because it's open source. And, well, it's open source for a reason, for everyone to use and test and try because, like us, they also want to do the next thing and, and write the best software that they can possibly do, right? And uh, how do you see that growing in, in the next years? Like, uh, but I, I would say like as a, um, a worldwide product, like, but also inside ING, do you think you will have more uh, teams using uh, this kind of approach? Yeah, definitely. And it always needs to come from a driver. And if I need to speak about ING, uh, I'm, I'm very passionate about what I do and how I do it at the moment. And um, working with a lot of talented mobile developers within ING, I try to share what we're doing with everyone and uh, make them understand that this is something that is going to happen in the future. And no, it's not going to be the, the silver bullet for everything, but we can do it. And it also doesn't mean that we have to run everything in production, everything needs to be swift. No, it can also be your uh, testing environment, your staging environment where you run automated tests against. If you, as a mobile engineer, quickly want to test something out, just check out Kitura or Vapor and write your own uh, uh, backend to, to play around with if you want. So. It, it gives you the, the uh, ability as an engineer to write end-to-end -end software again within the same language. And I think that's, uh, that's, that's worth something. Mm, that's interesting because I, I was not really aware of the, the fact that most and mo uh, more and more uh, iOS developers are telling me like I'm always uh, rewriting the same kind of app. So sometimes I'd like to like see something else. Yeah. And it's the Swift, the server-side Swift is kind of an opportunity to do that. Was that your case? Oh yeah, it's a refresher. It's really I've been doing uh, like server exclusively for a few months. Yeah. Uh, it's a total change of perspective. Um, I love it. I mean, I'm, it's back to my roots because my original uh, coding experience is in Unix. But I mean, it's very nice because um, I used to be an anti-Swift on the server advocate, uh, mostly because of the tooling. Uh, I've been a big user of Kotlin and Vertex. Uh, the tooling is fantastic, and the tooling for Swift is really not up to par right now. But it works. I mean, you can. The, the main reason is that you can work in Xcode to develop and test your server on your Mac. That's, that's strange. Uh, like the first time you launch Xcode and like you send a request to your. Well, you know, Vapor is really just a framework. Yeah. And it's really simple. It's not that simple, but it's really simple to to get and run. Uh, so yes, the ease with which you can develop the, the the server compensates the lack of tooling you have on Linux and and the lack of debugging ability you have on the server, which is one of the reasons why I, I, I talk about testing so much because testing is really key to the success of your or stability of your product. When you push the button, you want to be sure that everything is going to work fine. Yeah, la last year we had a talk uh, from uh, JP Simar. Uh, about uh, how do you actually measure the performance of Swift on the, the Linux uh, on a Linux machine? It was really interesting. So if you if you need to to have more details, uh, check this out. And about about tooling and monitoring, we had a question around like how do you uh, monitor the code? I know that Kitura comes from uh, comes with um, some tools, some basic tools. But did you had to add some specific uh, uh, tooling to I don't know manage the logs, manage the the, the monitoring? Uh, of the server? That's a good question, actually. And the answer to that is no. We didn't have to ask for anything different, because uh, it comes directly with uh, Prometheus uh, integration, where we, can, uh, where we can log everything to. And we can use our favorite tools to well display that uh, on any screen that we want. Prometheus is kind of a, like a standardized way to share uh, monitoring, right? Correct, correct. And then with Grafana and Graphite, we take out uh, uh, the data that's put in there, and we, uh, we have the logs. Obviously, we also monitor, monitor all our, uh, our servers, where it's running on. We check the load, et cetera. Um, but this is the one thing we're kind of like a little bit spoiled. We have a lot of hardware at ING. And well, if it needs one or two machines, sometimes it doesn't really matter. But we really monitor everything. And we also see, uh, uh, we also see that what they promise is really true. It really consumes less memory than, for example, a similar thing in Java. Um, I saw on the Twitter if we could share uh, our thoughts on why we chose for Kitura and how did we 
compare that to the other frameworks, and I would be more than happy to share our ideas and why did we why did we make a choice 15 months ago on a, on a block that I will write. Yeah, and same about uh, like we had a question around like uh, if we if you can share the slides, uh, the the uh, Chris Bailey slides around the performance, and uh, we had this talk from Chris Bailey last year or two years ago, I don't remember. Uh, so check this out. They, he spends uh, quite some time explaining what are the benefits of uh, yeah. Swift versus uh, Java or Ruby. Yeah, I think we've, we're done. Um, thank you very much, guys. Uh, thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you for everything. <laughs>